Hey, all my beautiful little peaches out there, and welcome back to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast. My name is Devannon. I am your host. Thank you for joining me again another week. As I stated last week, we're in the process on the back end of switching from one hosting platform to the other. And so I'm taking a pause from releasing brand new episodes, though I am still recording them most days of the week. And so I've got plenty of content in the pipeline. So I'm taking advantage of this brief pause to do some throwbacks and highlight some of some of the episodes that I think are relevant to what God is stirring in my heart right now. And so for today, we're throwing back to episode number 75, which featured the lovely Miss Emily Dufton, who is a drug historian and podcast host. And we talked about marijuana, the marijuana, governmental overreach, um, in you know, and, and things along that lines, political influences, the, the terrible, terrible, quote unquote, war on fucking drugs, which is nothing more than a witch hunt against people of color. And basically what that boils down to is a lack of boundaries. Whenever we have a lack of boundaries, shit gets out of order. God is not going to dwell in a place and give peace where people don't show restraint. And so when you have people in government, specifically white people who like to be in control, you know, using things like the war on drugs to basically fuck with people. It's not about order and, you know, the good of society. Okay, marijuana grows fucking outside. It is not for humans to come along and be like, you can't smoke that. Okay, people didn't create that shit. It just grew like that. And so that is an example of boundaries. In, in this episode, we talk about, you know, where do the rights of children end and parents begin? in terms of some of these laws that are out there about what kids can and cannot do in terms of marijuana. You know, when is it too much? When is the government getting involved too much? All of this has to do with a lack of boundaries, a lack of respect, and a lack of restraint. People in government positions have power. That doesn't mean they got to fucking use it all. That it doesn't mean that they have to use it all in a certain way. You know, I often say just because you can does not mean you should. I must say that again. Just because you fucking can does not mean you fucking should. People in this day and time have a real big problem with letting their options dominate them, letting power control them. So what we see in the government is a spirit of oppression. You know, pe people in government like to control. People in the church like to control. And this is everything that is the antithesis of what God is and what he intended it to be. And now you have religion and politics and government and all this shit all wrapped up together in one messy ass orgy. And Okay, all in the same damn bed and nothing but chaos has ensued from it. This country, in my opinion, is the biggest example of how you can disrespect people within your own ranks and within your own culture. This country is the biggest example of schisms and division when we could all very easily be on the same page. It, it, you know, this translates into relationships, be it friendships, business relationships, romantic relationships. When you don't have boundaries, when people don't demonstrate restraint, that means people get too tunnel vision into their own selfish needs to the detriment of other people. And then shit gets thrown into chaos. You could have had a perfectly good, you know, e balanced, well-balanced relationship where everybody could have had what they want in business. You see business partners cleaning out the bank account and disappearing, you know, and fucking leaving their business partner high and dry. I've seen this happen to people I know before, you know, in families. You got people way too goddamn concerned about what each other are doing and trying to control the other person. I've seen this happen in churches. You got people too damn concerned about who's doing what when they're not at church, worrying about who you're hanging out with. You can't drink. You can't do this. You can't do that. Just so you can come and be on staff there, or hell, even attend the church. Um, and romantic relationships. You got one partner sitting at home. The other partner lying about where they're at and who they're out there with, not just in my life. This has happened a thousand times, twice told, and it's way too fucking goddamn common. All of this is a lack of boundaries, a lack of restraint, you know, from the, from the smallest micro example up to the most, you know, up to the government level. It's all the same spirit. It's all the same deception. You know, in the Bible, we see this in Adam and Eve story, you know, we got the apple, we got the tree of life, all of that. God gave Adam and Eve every fucking other thing, but he tested them. And he was like, this one thing over here, I don't want you to do that. Sure, you can reach out and nibble on it, but I don't want you to. <laughs> okay, the devil comes along 
and twist it around and said, oh, God didn't mean that. He said, the day that you eat this apple, you will surely die. Oh, he said, you will not surely die. The devil changed one word and through, and, and, and through that one word, deceived them. And here we have our first liars. God came down to enter into judgment with them because of what they had done. You can't hide nothing from God. There are no secrets. Only the delusion of secrets, which has given, been given to you by the spirit of Satan. There are no secrets. Everything that's done will become to light because it really already is in many ways. Then they start gaslighting God, trying to say, oh, no, I didn't do it. The, the woman made me do it. The devil made me do it. The victim playing and then the blaming, the pointing fingers started with the very first people. This is a tale as old as time. Thank God for Jesus, though, because we fast forward to his story when he was led of the spirit after being baptized by John the Baptist into the wilderness to be tempted of the same devil who tempted Adam and Eve. OK, but we see how you can do it and pass the test. The devil offered Jesus three things he offered him bread to eat and jesus said you know what man can't live by bread alone what does bread represent consumption consumerism the devouring nature of mankind to go out and get whatever the hell it is that they want from money the sex the drugs the travel the children to pour into whatever the fuck you know over obsessing at the gym being there 15 goddamn you know fucking hours a day that's an exaggeration but you get my point it was out of balance the, you know, the devil said, told Jesus, just throw himself off the side of the mountain because he knew that Jesus had power to call angels to come and save him. What does this get into? Jesus said, no, he won't do it for you shall not tempt the Lord, your God, because we don't, you know, when we let ourselves get in the dangerous situations, thinking we can just use God as a good luck token to get out of it. That's called a presumptuous sin. And Jesus refused to do it because God is not a good luck charm for us to just go and reach out. When we know the shit we about to go do, it's terrible and wrong and we've been warned. And then we decide we're just going to fucking go do it anyway, thinking we can just run back and call God. Most of y'all don't have strong enough relationships with God like that to think he's just going to come and do that for you. You know, a lot of people barely pray or they only go to God when they want something. How would you respond if people kept doing that to you? Only calling on you when you want something. That's no real relationship. That's one side of hell. And, um, you know, and, and I, and I highly recommend y'all get more spiritually balanced into looking at God as just, you know, somebody who just do shit for you whenever you want. He's nice enough to do it, but how do you feel when people do that to you? And then Jesus, then the devil had the nerve to tell Jesus, look at all these kingdoms of the world and all their glory. If you give, if you bow down to me, I'll give you all of this. What was the devil really offering Jesus? Power, options, the ability to... Uh, you go out in the world and have experiences and do things. People don't really understand how much that they give away of themselves just to have more things to be able to go and do. And, and the Lord told Satan at that point to get thee behind me for, for you shall have no God other than the Lord and him only will you serve. People worship their children. They worship their bank accounts. They worship their ability to get money. They worship sex. They worship their ability to have relationships. They worship the relationships. They worship the people they're in the relationship with. They worship everything but God. People worship themselves. And all of this is a lack of boundaries. Jesus demonstrated restraint. He's the son of God. He had all power. Jesus tempted him with what he knew. Jesus tempted me. I'm sorry. Satan tempted Jesus with what he knew he could do. The devil is gonna, it's not going to bring you anything as a form of temptation that's without out of your reach. You know, he's going to bring you something that you damn well can do and something that you like. And he's going to package that shit so well and make you feel so good while you're doing it. You're not going to realize that you're really killing yourself in the process. But when your mind is enlightened and your eyes are open like Jesus's was, then we have our contrast. Adam and Eve, the devil tempted them with something that was within their reach, the apple. And they said, sure. With Jesus, the devil tempted him to something, the things that were within his reach. And he said, hey, oh, no, nah, I'm not going to do that because even though it's going to feel good in the moment, I know what, what's going to happen after the fact. And it's not worth temporary satisfaction for permanent damage and trouble after it. Jesus was not short-sighted like Adam and Eve were. I need y'all to catch the difference, okay, and decide that you're going to be like Jesus and not, like, and not demonstrate and display the weakness of humanity. Or as the Bible tells us, that somebody, anybody who does not have self-control, if you do not have self-control, you are like 
a city that is broken down and without walls. I'm going to say that again. If you do not have, and this is in the book of Proverbs, if you don't have self-control and self-restraint, you cannot say no. Then you are like a city that is broken down and without walls. And it doesn't matter how pretty you are. It doesn't matter how much the world applauds whatever you're doing. Because James 4 tells us that to be friends with the world is to be enemies with God. And you can't have it both ways. And so just because people are high-fiving you and everybody's there doing the same damn thing, there's countless examples in the Bible and even outside of the Bible in the world where a whole bunch of people got together and decided they were going to do some shit and ended up getting their asses annihilated because it wasn't a fucking good idea. I've cautioned y'all to stop looking to humans to tell you what's right and wrong. You have to learn the truth within yourself because this world is not a smart world. It's not a wise world. And people often get together to do very dangerous and unwise, foolish things to get their asses caught up in trouble. Okay. <laughs> you can see that in the January 6th riot. You can see that in how people go out and get themselves hurt doing, running off with people they barely know and shit like that. You can see it in people making unwise business investments that just was packaged a certain kind of damn way and they didn't do, do, didn't do due diligence research, you know. So we want to be smart. We want to be strong. We don't want to be weak. We don't want to be controlled by vice. We don't want to be controlled by option. Options are the illusion of freedom. Okay, just because you can doesn't mean you should, and you want to show discipline and restraint. What Jesus did for those 40 days and 40 nights when he was in the wilderness, he let go of his power in order to gain more. He went down so that he could come back up. He, he could go and he could have gone and done anything, and he chose to go without and to show sacrifice. Okay, he entered what I call a void, a time of not doing, even though he had been doing, he entered a, a temporary time of not doing. Trying to get somebody to go, to go without something they can do in this day and time, it's like asking them to give, give you their left leg and their left nut. Okay, like what? You want me to not do something for a while? Where they do that at? <laughs> okay, apparently not in your house. But if you're going to grow spiritually and in your character, you're going to have to learn to deny yourself, as the Bible says, and pick up your cross and follow the Lord. And that means telling yourself no for some shit that you used to be able to do or like to do. That's where fasting comes in, learning how to discipline yourself to not do what you're used to doing. You might feel like you're going to turn into a Russian toad or a fucking, you know, Halloween jack-o'-lantern or some shit. It's just an unusual feeling, baby. You're actually not going to die from like telling yourself no and taking a break from doing the shit you're used to doing. <laughs> when you deny your flesh, you strengthen your spirit. When you let your flesh run wild and do everything you want to do and you try to justify that shit in your mind, you kill your soul. You can't have, you can't enhance your spirit, spirit and flesh like that at the same time. Because when y'all go out and do things, your intentions, you know, just check your intentions, your true, true intentions. Are you really trying to enhance the world around you or are you really trying to gain just for yourself? Monitor yourself, control yourself. This is what our government does not do in the United States. This is what people do not do in their lives. And ergo, we have the fucking chaos running rampant here in the United States. This episode brings this to us in the form of the war on drugs and how it has spiraled out of control. God is speaking to us in all kinds of ways to tell us this simple thing. Control yourself. Put him first. Take only what you need from anything that you do and be sure that whatever you go and do, you do it with love first and trying to enhance the world around you, knowing who you are and why you are. And then you can have a positive and peaceful and truthful and authentic existence. This is everything the United States is not. This is everything the war on drugs is not. It never was because it was a lie from the beginning. So today we rebuke the spirit of oppression. We rebuke the spirit of deception as we throw back to this episode number 75 with Emily Dufton, our drug historian. I hope you all enjoyed. I hope you learn something and get some new knowledge up in that brain between those two ears of yours. I love you all. Reach out to me with your concerns. I give you Emily Dustin. You're listening to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast, where we discuss whatever the fuck we want to. And yes, we can put sex and drugs and Jesus all in the same bed and still be all right at the end of the day. My name is Devannon, and I'll be interviewing guests from every corner of this world as we dig into topics that are too risque for the morning show as we strive to help you understand what's really going on in your life. There is nothing off the table, and we've got a lot to talk about, so let's dive right into this episode.
Emily Dufton is an author, podcast host, and a drug historian who has blessed the world with a phenomenal book, which is entitled Grassroots, The Rise and Fall and Rise of Marijuana in America. This book offers phenomenal advice for marijuana slash drug activists and encourages us to not rest on our laurels, assuming that drug decriminalization is here to stay. Now, I fell in love with Miss Emily when I discovered her while listening to the to the readout podcast hosted by the great Joanne Reed over on MSNBC. And it was a surreal delight to sit down and talk with Emily about what's going on with the drugs right now, as well as what was going on with drugs back then. Also, we'd like everyone to please check out our YouTube channel because for this very special episode, Emily and I have donned our Halloween costumes. She's a hot dog and I'm Fred Flintstone. You have got to check them out. Have a super safe Halloween, everyone. Hello and happy Halloween, everyone, and welcome to this very special edition of the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast. I wish you all a very, very spooky weekend. I have with me the great, multi-talented, multi-faceted, delicious and nutritious Emily Dufton. How are you, girl? Oh, my God, I'm feeling delicious and nutritious. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> that was a fucking lootly. Like, you look delicious and nutritious. So you're dressed as a hot dog. I am. So I'm curious. When you told me previously that you're a hot dog every year. And so I've been wondering. So some years are you like a vegan hot dog? Another year you're like a Polish sausage. You switch <laughs> up the bun. Like, how exactly does it go? <laughs> oh, the hot dog is in the eye of the beholder. I am. That's how it is. I think, you know, I live in Tacoma Park, Maryland. It's known as the Berkeley of the East. I think many people see me as a tofu dog, as a beyond, beyond hot dog. Others as deeply oh. adjacent, you know, we're like, I could be a half smoke. I could be, I'm just, I just wear this because it's a costume I found on the side of the street in Capitol Hill in DC, where I was living at the time. And I thought, this is amazing. Someone is just giving away a hot dog costume. I'm going to give it a home and I'm going to be a hot dog every year from now until it literally falls apart. And so that's why I'm a hot dog every year. <laughs> brand new. I love it. Thank you. It gets washed from time to time. <laughs> time to time. Look, I love me a good wiener girl. So. <laughs> <laughs> I could be I could be the wiener of your dreams. Who knows? Let's see. We can put the the top up for a minute. See? It's great. <laughs> that is what okay. I'm like right there, y'all. So <laughs> So Emily is an author and a drug historian. She holds a PhD in American Studies from George Washington University. She is the <laughs> author of a fabulous book called Grassroots: The Rise and Fall and rise of marijuana in America has to do with how 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 earnest hippies, frightened parents, suffering patients, and other ordinary Americans went to war over the marijuana. It was a little description I had of that. Before we go much further, I want to take a moment to give a shout out to Miss Joy Ann Reed over at the Readout on MSNBC because that is how I discovered you. Oh, wow. <laughs> I saw you on her podcast, and then I heard what you had to say about your grassroots book, and then I fell in love with <laughs> you. And when I built up the courage and got 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 more body of works under my belt, I sent you a message, you know, hoping and praying that you would respond, and you did. And so... <laughs> well, touch my heart. I'm so happy to be here. And honestly, like, I... The idea that, that, oh, you would be all nervous to talk to me makes me just like ache a little bit on the inside. I'm so happy to talk to you. And this is such an honor for me to be here. We are, you wrote a book. We are equals. We know, we know what it is to go into the, the pain cave of writing and, and try to create something intelligible and lengthy about complicated subjects, you know? So writer to writer, you and I are, we are eye to eye. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Offage. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so, I, so I'm like a glittery version of Fred Flintstone because 
As far as I'm concerned, we all know what Fred Friendstone and Barney Rubble were really doing over in bed rock, honey. And so... <laughs> I had rock. I mean, come on. <laughs> Hell yeah. It was right in front of us this whole time. <laughs> Barty rubbed the toe to bottom. I know it. <laughs> so in your own words, I've given like my take on you. Is there anything you'd like to say about yourself, your own personal history or anything? Gosh, like, what, like about writing grassroots or about like what? Like a, about me as a human being? Anything about you at all? Your favorite color? The place you traveled? We're going to get into grassroots right after you tell us whatever you'd like to say. Just about Oh, my God. At all, since I've already given a little history. So you don't have oh, to. Oh, lovely. I'm a Pisces sun, Sagittarius rising, Pisces moon. I have two children, a boy who's six, a little girl who's almost three. I'm working on my second book right now, which is about the history of medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. And I won a couple grants to fund the work, and it's been super awesome. And hopefully I'm going to go to Switzerland either at the end of this year or the beginning of next year to compare addiction treatment programs over there with America's treatments. So those are, I think, by far the most pertinent facts about me that everyone should, should know. <laughs> I think those are pretty damn good and relevant facts. The, the, the resurgence of healing with the drugs. Look, I just got back from Portland, Oregon, doing shrooms and cell, so that is a psilocybin and what the fuck else? I did MDMA. I'd never okay. did shrooms before in my life. And since I'm a veteran who suffers from PTSD, OCD, and you know, all of these things. And I saw on Netflix in the How to Change Your Mind documentary and on PBS. Yeah of mental illness documentary how they've been using these hallucinogenics to help veterans and i thought okay i'm not gonna wait for this to be approved i'm gonna fly my happy ass up here and do these shrooms man it took seven grams for me to like feel anything and apparently that's like a lot and wow. so i don't know apparently <laughs> besides the social world that context yeah so you did like an official like like clinical trial it wasn't a trial. I paid for this. I found a social worker who was willing Ooh. to do it in a psychiatric setting. Uh -huh. He feel like his woods, like an, an hour north of Portland, into his cabin in the woods, so that because he was like insistent that the environment be like right. Sure. And so it was like a guided assistant thing. It was a, it was clinical, but I paid for it. I wasn't. I didn't wait for a trial. <laughs> totally, totally understood. That's awesome. How was it? Was it a good experience? It follows me. So in a good way. So like if I smoke weed, it does not have an effect on me. I've tried different strands, different states, different times. I used to sell the hell out of it back in my drug dealing days, but I never fooled with it too much. I used to sell shrooms. I never did them either. But I have discovered that if I do like a CBD gummy, mm. I will be sitting around looking like Tawali from South Park. I feel that. But... <laughs> So the, the CBD does the same thing that the MDMA and the shrooms did. Mm -hmm. It quieted my mind. Mm -hmm. I was expecting to have one of those like really jerky experiences like I saw in the documentary, but that did not happen for me at all because my mind is always like this with the OCD and the PTSD and everything. Mm -hmm. For me, what those, what those hallucinogenics did was it just neutralized it. And so I was just like still and just silent and quiet. And so I have found things that I used to, that I used to have anxiety over. I don't. Mm. And so basically that peace, it, it attached itself to me in those, in that state of mind. I love that. So, so it quieted your mind down. How long did the quietness last? It's ongoing. So I was, while the drugs had their effect on me, Okay, on this room, you know, the trees started to like move and the prints, you know, the pattern in the carpet started dancing and doing its own thing and whatnot. So that was kind of freaky. But once that all settled down, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, so it's not like it was, I, I have found this has been like maybe three weeks ago that I was mm -hmm. in Portland. I, it hasn't changed. You know, I still oh. feel 
piece. It's like, and I experienced the same thing when I started experimenting with the CBD gummies, which has only been like maybe two or three months ago that mm -hmm. I discovered that these gummies will have an impact on me. That's interesting. It's like, it's, it's a permanent thing with me. Is wow. That... And have you had any kind of, I don't know, like sessions or counseling or anything to kind of talk about like, you know, sort of digesting the effects of it or like maybe, I don't, I don't even know what the word is, but have, have you communicated at all with the guy who led the session since? He, he was, he is open to that and he wanted to schedule a follow-up, but I, and I can reach out to him if I want to, Emily, mm -hmm. but I, I was ready, you know, yeah. like writing my blog and my books and the show. And I see a, a social worker every week. Anyway, I see a licensed family marriage therapist couple of times a month for me and my boyfriend. And then I see a hypnotist therapist once a month. And so I'm always professing and manifesting the change that I want. I went into it yeah. ready. I didn't really yeah. body to do too much hand holding. And I'm all like, I'm ready to let this shit go. Like, mm -hmm. We can talk about it, but it's already done. <laughs> oh, that's great. And this is the thing that allowed you to do that. Like, you're just like, I just need that final push to get it out. Right. I love that. Oh, true. guy. Oh, yeah. Sorry, keep going. You go. You're the guest, girl. Oh, no. I'm just saying there's someone. So I live right outside of D.C. in Tacoma Park, Maryland, and uh, which I think I've said already. But there's this doctor who just moved here and started a practice where he's doing exactly that. He's using ketamine, though. And so he's doing these like lead ketamine therapy sessions. And then afterwards, he offers sessions to I'm trying to remember like the verb he used. It wasn't like aggregate, but it was like to sort of like digest the experience. So you have this experience with ketamine that will hopefully release in the patient the same kind of things that released in your experience. And then he would kind of provide the counseling or the the therapy sessions to help sort of bring, make, make, manifest the effects. And I thought, oh my God, like here it is. It's, 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 here, you know, like sort of this process, this ability to access these drugs in this therapeutic, you know, private, like obviously, like you know, industrial way, but it's here. And God, that is like ten years ago. I think experiences like yours or like the one that this doctor is offering would have been like unimaginable. And yet now they're here and they're moving into all these communities. You know, it's not just Portland, Oregon. It's like here and right outside of DC, it's everywhere. And that to me is a totally fascinating aspect of like drug policy in the United States. That's wild. Totally nuts. I'm so happy to have it here too. But as you warn in your book, the grassroots that we're about to get into, you know, these things tend to come and go at times. Yeah because this wasn't the first time that we were on the border of finding therapeutic uses for drugs before the dr war on drugs shut it down. Right. And we're happy to have it back. And towards the end of the interview, I was most intrigued with the, the six lessons that you have for grassroots advocate <laughs> people at the end. And so I'm really going to let you give that advice because I really feel like people need to hear that because people are feeling really grassrooty these days. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it would be great for them to to hear hear your advice so that they can be helped. I had to go get my copy. I haven't looked at that in a while. That's right. I forgot I had like six little lessons in the back. The one I remember them. Yes, make your argument as sympathetic as possible was lesson one, because the more you center like a really sympathetic identity in the middle of your campaign, the more likely people are to feel bad for you and generate empathic warmth and support, right? Which is why you always see like puppies, like with their ribs exposed because they're starving in the rain, chained to a box. And you're like, please take my money to save the puppy. Lesson two, it's all about the money, which is exactly what we were talking about. Money buys influence. Lesson three, be prepared to watch your progress disappear. Lesson four, don't rely too heavily on the White House. Lesson five, respect your opposition. And lesson six, keep a sense of perspective. Wow, I forgot I wrote these. That's so interesting. Yeah, like, you know, oh. what's, sorry, keep going. No, thank you. So we'll talk about those towards the end because I thought those would be cute. Okay. So you can just kind of like, you know, peruse over that while we're going through. And, and then, of course, people go buy the books. So if you're a grassroots person and you want to figure out 
how to escape some pitfalls and things like that. I think this is a really good book. And if you want to have insight, because we're all so passionate about this, you know, this resurgence and everything, but I think that your book, you know, is like so evergreen, you know, in the, in the sense that, you know, it's an ongoing battle in this country, because as you say, it's the rise, the fall, the rise, you know, it goes back and forth. There's no reason for us to be so arrogant as to assume that it can't fall again, because as you lay out in the book, every time we have a, a rise for decriminalization, there's an opposing force that wants to fight that. Right. And so, and it was no different then. It's the same way now. So you wanted to give a warning though for Halloween candy. I wanted to be sure that we <laughs> have time for that because that was something you specifically oh. requested. And so tell us your, this is, this is Emily's warning about this Halloween candy, y'all. Oh my God. It's less of warning and just oh. more of like, a, like I, I just, every year, well, this year in particular, I feel like there have been a lot of news stories about the rainbow colored sentinel that apparently is going to show up in children's Halloween stashes nationwide. And I love it because like, it just goes to show how drugs, the concept of drugs, right? When we talk about drugs, we're never just talking about drugs, right? We're always talking about larger issues and larger questions and larger ideas. And I feel like this, like the new fear of 2022, Halloween 2022 of fentanyl being dispersed widely in like Halloween candy is just, it's a really convenient vehicle for like political mudslinging, right? And, you know, so the right can mudsling at the left by saying, oh, it's the liberal open border policies that is allowing Mexican cartels to funnel this rainbow colored fentanyl across the borders. And now it's going to, now my kid's going to eat it thinking it's a sweet tart and die. So that's how like the right is mudslinging the left. And then the left mudslings the right in return by saying, right, you're so stupid. No drug dealer is going to give away drugs for free. That is not how the drug dealing works. <laughs> so there's just this, and like, you know, so whenever we're talking about drugs, we're always talking about so much more than just drugs. Like, they're dr like the concept of drugs is weighted with all of these other topics that we like press upon it. And it becomes something that is like kind of like a football, right? It's just always being thrown back and forth, you know? People are always going to use the concept of drugs or the concept of punishment or the concept of treatment as a political vehicle to achieve other ends, right? Whether those are financial or moral or law enforcement, whatever. But I just feel like the Halloween candy <laughs> saga that we go through every year is like kind of a good sort of visual entry point on to this topic that like drugs are always much more than just drugs, right? There are ways for us to discuss as Americans and as human beings concepts that are obviously like much more complicated and oftentimes more complex than just like fentanyl or pot or whatever else itself. So I guess that's like my opening concept for a conversation. <laughs> yeah, so as a former drug dealer, I can attest to what Mr. Mrs. Dustin is saying is true. <laughs> we don't have to run around giving away drugs for free, honey. It's just <laughs> not to little children who don't have money to come back and buy any once they get addicted. That's <laughs> <laughs> it's a it was a profoundly bad marketing plan. No one benefits from it. No one benefits. <laughs> but, you know, just like, you know, as you state in your book, you know, the fear mongering, you know, the fear mongering is like a big deal coming from the left. And so, I mean, coming from the right. <laughs> so, and sometimes the left. <laughs> it can, it can. It pains me to say, but it's just so true. <laughs> you know, sometimes we have to be honest about our own. You know, <laughs> you know what? I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want a political party. I just want to be like me. I just want to be like me. You know, <laughs> whatever makes it be you and me. What do you think about what Biden did though with the rolling back the the the, the legal the, the the cases against people with the marijuana charges? I mean, it was really interesting, right? It was kind of came out of nowhere, right? He hadn't talked much about like marijuana policy at all on the campaign trail or during these first two years. I remember Kamala Harris during the vice presidential debate was the very first presidential or vice presidential candidate to ever say 
during a debate, like, yes, I support decriminalization. And she said that. So Kamala mentioned it, but like Biden never did. So he comes out and he makes this announcement and it's like, it's immediate effect is going to be relatively small because the only marijuana convictions he's allowed to overturn are ones that he can control and he can only control federal convictions for possession. And that's not that, like that many. It's about 6,500 nationally. And it's, I don't know the number. No one would give it. No one would give it. But it's also convictions for possession in D.C. because D.C. is federal. So that actually, that number might be con more considerable than 6,500. But like, I have not seen a news outlet give it yet. But anyway, like that's pretty small compared to the millions of people who have been arrested. It's kind of a drop in the bucket. But what he also said was he was going to talk to the Department of Health and HHS, Health and Human Services. He's going to talk to the FDA and he's going to talk to the DEA through this three federal agencies in charge of drug policy and talk about, and he wanted to talk about descheduling cannabis. So right now, pot is a Schedule One drug and it's been a Schedule One drug since 1970. And being Schedule 1, that means that the federal government considers it to have no medical utility and a high risk for abuse, which is, of course, very silly. Since 1996, it became medical marijuana. So, of course, it has some medical utility. Schedule 1 placement has been kind of nuts for at least since 1996. He wants to talk about descheduling it, taking it out of the schedules completely. And if you deschedule a drug... That means it can become a legitimate, legal marketplace item like cigarettes or alcohol. It could become a commercial product. And that is a really big decision. It's already kind of becoming a commercial product, but those industries are like very cottage still. Like there is a huge medical marijuana industry and there is a growing recreational cannabis industry but they're still like in the span of things right like along the spectrum of of products it's still fairly small so to de-schedule it completely and turn it into a commercial product that would transform the cannabis industry in the united states and ultimately worldwide so it's a huge decision it's a huge it's this it's the beginning of a huge conversation so like right after he made that announcement it was right before last weekend People were like, I didn't really know what to make of it, honestly. But the more I've read like things on Twitter from people I respect and some articles, the more I realize he's launching like a pretty huge conversation. And now would be the time for activists who are interested in creating as, you know, equitable and kind of fundamentally good natured in industry as possible, like now would be the time for them to really get involved because, you know, conversations about, about descheduling are happening and those are, those are important. And, you know, the time to influence the marketplace is now because it's starting to take shape, which is crazy. I mean, it's like the same thing we were talking about before where like, now you can go someplace and have like ketamine treatment. Like these things are available. So it's time to figure out what like we actually want the industry to look like. Hell yeah, it's time to tap into that energy and push it forward. I feel you on that. So, so, so in your book, you, you take us from like prohibition back in the first part of the last century, you know, all the way up to the day. And I thought it was very artfully done. So I wanted to read a little excerpt about, about the way like marijuana was viewed back then from way back in 1917 from, from your book, if I may. And so. So it says the 1917 report from the Treasury Department noted that in Texas, only Mexicans and sometimes Negroes and lower class whites smoked the marijuana for pleasure and warned that drug crazed minorities could harm or assault upper class white women. Mm -hmm. I felt like this, you know, that sort of thinking still informs policy today. And I felt like when movies like the Terrible Truth and Reefer Madness, which you mentioned in the book, came out. I felt like that was like media's way of locking arms with the government and echoing what they're saying 
and you don't really get into religion deeply, but I feel like the church also touched and agreed. Yes. So. The church was responsible for paying for the production of the movie Reefer Madness. I don't, which church it, it was, I don't remember, but it was funded by evangelical Christians. There you go. There's your connection. Mm-hmm. And see, I don't know. Like, I, I hate the fact that the church, I would have rather the church stand up and say, you know what, it's not for the government to enforce morality because God is not for so He's always gave the children of Israel a choice. He never came down here and mandated things in the way that we're trying to mandate them. So why don't we back off and leave this whole morality thing to the church? Instead, the church was like, well, we like to control people. The government likes to control people. So why don't we see if we can control them all together? Mm-hmm. <laughs> collaborate. Right? Like, oh, my God. <laughs> it's so true. And it's been so powerful <laughs> like, for so long. For so long. But it's true. Like, can you legislate morality? I mean, like, that's just this eternal question. And, you know, you really... You really can't. You can't punish someone until they're good. It just doesn't work that way, you know? No, nobody responds to that. You know, our children don't. And I love that your kids are like pretty much the same age as my two kids, which happen to be like Maine Coon mixed cats. You know, my oldest boy is about is about to be six in March and then my girl is three. <laughs> oh, we have babies the same age. That's so funny. That's crazy. Wow. But it's true, like, you can't make them be good through fear or punishment, like, ever, ever. And and that it just always makes things worse. It always makes things worse. And that's why, like, I mean, that's why it's so hard oftentimes to have, like, rational discussions about things like drugs or religion, because, like, people just get too emotionally involved that you kind of think, like, you're going to you're going to believe my way or I'm going to hurt you. Like, I'm going to defend this to the point of violence. And that's just... Like, that's why I, <laughs> some people get mad at me about grassroots because they felt like I didn't take a firm enough stand, you know, either way. And some people also, like, seem to have a really hard, <laughs> a hard, they seem to have some difficulty with differentiating between smoking pot and writing about pot as, like, a historical phenomenon. <laughs> like, a lot of people just, like, make these really dumb jokes, like, yeah, but you're using a lot of grass when you're writing grassroots or whatever and i was like no i was writing like a deeply researched like historical book based off of my phd dissertation like no i wasn't high the whole time like that's ridiculous but people were upset with me because i wasn't taking a firm enough stand like i wasn't coming out like very strongly as an activist for legalization or or alternatively against it i didn't make my my political position clear enough and i don't know if like in the same way you're saying like, well, who should legislate morality? You know, in the same way, I don't feel like history books necessarily have to be legislating morality, right? Like, I don't feel like I needed to tell people what to believe. I just wanted to tell them what happened and how we got here so that as things move forward and as we continue to watch this really like unique historical period evolve, we'll be more prepared to understand the potential downside that might occur or the potential benefits that might occur and like try to maybe guide the process more toward the benefits like rather than the downside so it's you know i do feel like there's a real need to understand drugs in like a non-emotional non-hot take non like just understanding them as like a historical artifact where like Certain things have happened from 1917 to today to create the world we live in. And we should probably understand how we got here. And so I wrote a book about it. <laughs> and now we're talking about it. All right. <laughs> uh, let's bring it full circle. I love it. And you're right. Your book is very energetically neutral. It is very energetically like neutral. Yeah. I did pick up on that. And, you know, most, you know, historians, they just tell what happened. And so. I, you know, I was interviewing somebody else and I was, and he had gotten some reviews that kind of ruffled his feathers. And I was telling him, you know what, I'll tell you the same thing. Like Amazon and all these different book places don't perform mental health tests on people who go on there and leave reviews. So they're going to tell them what you're going to get. So. Give me the most recent report from your therapist before you post on this video. 
Oh my God. The best review I got was someone was really mad that I was mean to Nancy Reagan. And they were like, it's not like she committed tax fraud. Nancy Reagan's not that bad. And I was like, is that your bar? Like tax fraud? Or... <laughs> so that was everyone else's reviews on Amazon are almost all from my friends. So those are all nice. <laughs> Yep. For all the friends I asked, like, please leave an Amazon review for my book. Thank you. <laughs> hey, nothing like that inner circle chosen family, baby. Oh, baby. That person commenting on the tax fraud, though, probably commits tax fraud. And they were projecting that. Oh, my God. 100%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to talk about Atlanta 1976 because <laughs> I felt like Miss Miss Marcia Manat Shunard, and I have to admit, when I read that name, immediately Angel Dimash nod from Rent from the musical. Oh my God. <laughs> it, it came to my mind and I had to go look it up. I was like, is there a relation here today? <laughs> Tomorrow for me, what's going on? <laughs> so, but there is no relation. I, none. <laughs> so it's inside, inside a gate. No, I can't unsee it. I can't unsee it. <laughs> and in Atlanta, especially because my boyfriend is from Atlanta. You know, okay. from that area. And so uh, Druid Hills, well to do neighborhood. Marsha is, you know, she's walked into like her teens having this party and everyone's like, you know, partying it up. Her and her husband go out, find like the weed butts and everything like that. And, and then she goes run snitch to all the other parents because, of course, there was other teenagers there. And we all know snitches get stitches, y'all. And so what I documented was the parents' reactions. You said the parents' reactions ran the gamut from shock, confusion, indignation, concern, denial, and hostility. Now, in the book, you, you know, this woman is like slated to be a Democrat. Mm -hmm. And so that really, really shocked me. And, and her, her emotions, I don't feel like those emotions have changed over the years. I feel like that's the same way people react today. Would you agree? Yeah, I think I think you're onto something there. Yeah, like it it was her her politics are really interesting. So he's she goes by Keith, which again is kind of like you have to get wrap your head around this woman with like mom of three who goes by Keith. And it was hard because I'm also writing about Keith Strop, the founder of Normal, the national organization for the uh -huh. marijuana laws, which are like, you know, going gangbusters at this time. So there's a lot of Keiths, you know, so Keep the Keiths straight in your mind. But so Keith Shuhart is this mom. She has a PhD in British literature. She's not teaching, but her husband is at Emory. And so she's like home with these kids. So like I see her as being really smart, probably pretty bored, right? Being home with kids. Like when you have a PhD and you're clearly like a life of the mind kind of person, being home with little kids can be like really boring. <laughs> <laughs> you can have like maybe a lot of uh, leftover energy. And so she throws this like backyard birthday party for her 13 year old daughter. And like the kids are acting weird and she's kind of freaking out. She sees like they're up in their bedroom, like looking out in the backyard, her and her husband. And uh, they see the lighters flicker in the bushes, but they assume it's cigarettes. But the kids are like really acting funny. And so once everybody leaves, they go into the backyard and they're searching around and they find roaches and they also find like like alcohol containers right so the kids aren't just smoking smoking pot they're, they're drinking too <laughs> the scandal the scandal 13 i mean 13 is young like for like i was not i was not playing those games at 13 but i understand that my experience is not the experience of everyone and and then now i'm like as a mom i'm kind of like oh if i caught henry doing that like i'd be probably be pretty pissed but but anyway so she like she goes into like hardcore activist mode, like right away. You know, she was like, boom. And she's buoyed by the concepts of second wave feminism that are like really prominent at the time where you do consciousness raising groups and you get together with people who are sharing your same experience and you talk about it, right? Because the personal is political and you try to figure out a way to change society for the better. Like that is very much like the kind of social milieu that Shuhard is coming from in, in 76 in Atlanta. Because remember, like, Atlanta is pretty liberal at this time. Like, Jenny Carter is 
governor and he's running for president, you know, like it's the bicentennial. Everybody's like super patriotic, right? It's an interesting time. So she gets together with all the other parents and she's like, our kids are smoking pot. This seems to be an issue. Like this, this is, this is, this is something we should probably pay attention to. And she kind of blames on the fact that for the past three years, more and more states had steadily been decriminalizing marijuana possession. So it started in Oregon in 73, but by 76, I think there were probably like, probably like six, five or six states by that point that had decriminalized. Georgia wasn't one of them, but others did. And so there's this burgeoning drug paraphernalia industry, like basically just like today, this was happening in the mid, the early 1970s, where like a semi-legal cannabis marketplace was taking shape in America. And when a marketplace builds and expands, more people tend to utilize this. So more people were using pot, more people were smoking pot, and it was trickling down and it was getting to kids. So like Keith Shuhard's daughter, 13, found some pot and was smoking it at her birthday party. And like that made Shuhard really upset. So even though she was a Democrat and she was a liberal, she was really opposed to what the liberal agenda had pushed, which was decriminalization. So she starts basically a nationwide grassroots army of parents to overturn decriminalization laws and kind of stop the burgeoning paraphernalia industry. And it just so happens that in 1980, four years later, when Ronald Reagan gets elected, he takes their concept, nationalizes it further, and then turns it into federal policy. So it was the parent movement that gave us basically the entire concept of just say no. So yeah, the 1980s were birthed in the 1970s in Atlanta, Georgia, 1976. <laughs> right. And right. Thank you for breaking that down so beautifully. And I, and I felt like from, from the way that you wrote, you really, really wanted people to know the importance that small community groups like this, actually the impact that they have on federal policy, not as so that we don't undervalue this or underestimate. Totally. And so it's amazing when you tap into a zeitgeist like that, like, like what, what Shuhart and other people in Atlanta tapped into was something that, and ended up people were feeling nationwide. And that's the exact same thing that was happening with medical marijuana laws. And it's the exact same thing that's happening with legalization laws now. I mean, people are tapping into, like, it's a zeitgeist right now, you know, like, more, like, I think Maryland where I live is, I think we're voting to legalize this. I think we're voting to legalize next month. Like it's movement, baby. It's movement. May the force be with you. May the force be, I think it'll pass pretty easily. I think it'll pass pretty easily. Now it's just a matter of what the market will look like, what we'll actually do with it in the state, which is crazy. It's a step. The thing that stood out to me about Mrs. Manashunad, <laughs> she, she, she kept saying like, it was like for the children, for the know, children. And for the children, you know, I'm getting like flashbacks to WandaVision. You know, <laughs> Disney when they're, you know, her and Vision, you know, Wanda Maximoff. Yeah, Marvel, you know, I'm like geeking out right now. But <laughs> the, they kept saying that thing for the children and there weren't any fucking children because she had to then she had put them all to sleep. But she I, I was like, OK, I wonder if she asked the children what they want or was she just using them to enforce her agenda? Every time I see like a politician, especially like. I mean, you know, especially like the Republicans and stuff like that, wanting to enact negative policies on behalf of veterans, for instance, me being a military veteran, right. I, I'm like, I don't want you to do that. Like everything you're doing, <laughs> I don't want you to do it. You didn't ask me. <laughs> but they're like, our veterans wouldn't want My choice? Yeah. No. And so, I don't know, that stood out to me like, I am. like I am. children, but they, they don't. I don't know what to call that. What do you call that when people do that? Are they, are they are they calling themselves doing it in the name of righteousness? Are they getting, now you're a parent now, so you have this feeling. Would you go and do something this adverse on behalf of your children without consulting their opinion first? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't understand. Ooh, they prefer that, right? They would love to, they love to give me their opinion. Right. But, you know, like, I think, I think you're going to a really important question, right? Which is like, where do the rights of children and and the rights of adults begin, right? So like when when Keith Shuhart and, every, and everybody else in the parent movement is saying, 
oh my God, we have to repeal decriminalization laws because of the children. Like, do it for the children. The children are being harmed by these drugs. But then that transforms from, like, we have to have these laws for the children to, we have to excessively punish adults for drug possession or dealing or whatever else excessively punish them, like especially after the 1986 Drug Abuse Act, right? When you're getting mandatory minimums of 5, 10, 15 years, when we're locking up millions of people for drug possession, like where does the rights of children end and like the rights of adults begin? And the pushback to that, the what about the children line of thought did finally start to come in the 90s, right? When marijuana legalization efforts dovetailed with the gay rights movement in what I think is just one of the most fascinating like historical coincidences ever right so in California in San Francisco as AIDS is starting to decimate the gay population you have a couple of activists including Dennis Perron and Brownie Mary Rathbun whose real name was Mary Jane which is crazy they're using marijuana to like give to these AIDS patients who like doctors don't want to touch. Nobody wants to get near them. No one knows what to do. No one knows how to treat HIV. It's brand new, right? And Brownie Mary and Dennis Perron are like, have a have a pot infused brownie. Like you're gonna get your appetite back. Your nausea's gonna chill out. You're gonna feel pretty good. You're gonna have some energy. You can like go to the bank. You can do like an errand, right? Before you die uh, horribly of AIDS. Like, my God, right? So they're saying, where did the rights of children end? Yes, we kept children so safe from pot that like by the early 80s, like no one is smoking pot anymore. And we're locking up tens of thousands of people, right? Like every month, right? Okay, great. We've done it. We won the drug war. But now it turns out this substance does have some medical utility for a patient group that is increasingly becoming like really sympathetic, you know, like, cause you have, I mean, Arthur Ashe contracts HIV. God, that little boy got it through like blood transfusion or something. So you start to like have like really sympathetic feelings towards oh, Princess Diana visits the HIV clinic in the San Francisco General Hospital, right? Like suddenly it becomes really sympathetic and laws start to change, right? Suddenly adults rights, especially like adults dying of AIDS and cancer, like their rights become much more important than protecting children from pot. And then we we'll kind of move like fast forward into the 2000s, 2010, the legalization movement joins with the social justice movement. So in 2010, Michelle Alexander publishes her book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, which is canonical at this point, canonical, I tell you. And like, it is all about the effects of locking up nonviolent offenders, the vast majority of which are black men. Like, well, what have we done in America by locking up millions of people? More people, more black people are incarcerated in the United States than in South Africa at the height of apartheid. Like, what effects does that have culturally, socially, economically? It has effects. And she lays them out and we're all like, oh my God, now we know. And laws started to change right after that, right? In 2012, you have the first states legalized, Colorado and Washington, by combining legalization with calls for social justice, right? If cannabis is the source of massive amounts of Black incarceration, legalize cannabis, right? That's one way to like act on social justice. And it was also legalized through outright calls for generating tax revenue. Right. Like here is something that we can legalize and tax the bejesus out of. And not only are we like doing good on social justice initiatives, but we're also going to make a boatload of money. Like it's a total win win at the moment. And that's basically, again, arguments for the rights of adults. Right. Should we should we incarcerate X number of million of people, millions of people for cannabis possession? So, again, like this argument for children's rights, which was like so immensely powerful in the 1970s and 80s has now, I would say, really been pushed to the back burner by almost three decades of really concerted and very powerful and very influential activism for adults' rights to access cannabis for medical and then social justice and economic initiatives. And that's the tea, y'all. Y'all have it. 
there's, there's wow. 50 years of cannabis history, guys. Woo. <laughs> and, you know, I work with, you know, so many people right now. And I, and I, I love how you, I feel like your book is almost like a, a user's manual for people who want to get into this fight. You know, you're giving historical context, you're giving advice and everything. And so, yeah, I'm thinking about, you know, a friend of mine, if, if, her name is Ifatayo Harvey, and she runs the People of Color Collective, People of Color Psychedelic Collective, which is based out of New York City. And, you know, and I, and I work with them, you know, I just did an interview, you know, for, I gave them an interview the other day and we were talking about like, you know, marijuana, you know, the way it's, you know, criminalized here in Louisiana, where I live versus where one of their uh, satellite locations is in Oregon and Portland. And so, you know, things like this are very helpful, you know, for young people, because these people are really, really like young who have started this, you know, psychedelic collective and everything like that. And so I think, books, you. yeah, right. I think books like this are so like useful. So we're nearing the end of our hour. And so I just wanted to mention, you mentioned normal earlier. I want to tell mm -hmm. you that stands for the, I think you said it, the National Organization for the Reform rather than repeal of marijuana laws. And then we'll go right into talking about like your, your lessons and things like that. And, and we may just pick like one or two that that's important to you. But, <laughs> and so another, another little, a final X suite from the book, I'm channeling my inner bugs bunny. So an X suite <laughs> from the book, it, it says normal, you know, or ML argue that marijuana smokers were consumers, not deviants and deserve the same rights to protection and safety as any other group, including access to the drug without pollutants or contaminants, a competitive marketplace free from monopolies and conglomerates, and especially freedom from harassment by the police. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, like a, a Southern Sunday guy. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. love it. I want you to record the audio book. That's great. I love it. <laughs> oh, I'll do it. I love getting on this microphone right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dude, I did my own audio book. Oh, that's awesome. And so I wanted to bring that up because like you had normal fighting for it. You had Miss, Miss Manash Shinar fighting against it back then. Like you say in the book, we have the same thing now because I don't want people to rest on their laurels and get so comfortable thinking that it's a home run. It's a clean slate. You know, we must stay vigilant. Mm. Yes, totally. I think that, I mean, it, it does feel like, to me, I feel like pot becomes the scariest drug around when there's no other booking in. So in like the 1970s, early 1970s, when the first decriminalization laws were being passed, we're also kind of going through a heroin epidemic, right? And right now we've been going through the opioid epidemic for like well, 30 years or so, <laughs> but it's kind of coming to its natural end at the same time that the legal cannabis marketplace is really starting to heat up. And when opioids become like, when there's no, like, like meth was a boogeyman for a while, crack was a boogeyman for a while, but opioids have been a bo the boogeyman for like 30 years. And if that starts to tamp down, we start to feel less scared about that. And there's like sort of like a void in like the drug boogeyman because, you know, we always need a drug boogeyman. We're America. We need a drug boogeyman. And um, pot will sometimes, I think, come back and fill that role. Like there, there could be widespread rejection of the legal marketplace. I mean, in certain places, right, like in Massachusetts that legalized however long ago, some communities don't want it. And they are allowed to say within that state's jurisdiction we do not want any cannabis marketplaces within our community borders. So there's going to be some nimbyism and there's going to be some yimbyism, like yes, in my backyard to it. But again, it's, you don't know what's like, we don't know what's going to happen. This is a brand new marketplace that could bust its boots. Like, I mean, it's been around for a decade now, which is amazing, but things are going to get big fast. And if people don't like it, it could very well turn, turn back around. I mean, that's not impossible. It's not, it's improbable, but not impossible. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do in the interest of time, I'll just read the title of each of the six. <laughs> and people can go and buy the book to get the advice that you have in there. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> and after I read the titles, then I'll let you have our last word, which is, a, which is another 
a page I borrowed from the book of Joy Reid because she, she always gives her guests, you know, like the last word and everything like that. And so I thought <laughs> that idea, I'm very inspired by that woman. And so, well, we love uh, it. so lesson one, make your argument as sympathetic as possible. The lesson two, it's all about the money. Uh, <laughs> lesson three, <laughs> be prepared to watch your progress disappear. That's the most shocking one for me. And in my, ten- in my opinion, the most sobering. Lesson mm-hmm. four, don't rely too heavily on the White House. And she means over multiple administrations. And then lesson five, respect your opposition. Lesson six, keep a sense of perspective, which is also a statement of humility. So her website is emilyduffton.com, social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Instagram, media. Oh, podcast, you can listen to Emily conduct interviews, new books, networks, has a drugs, addiction, and recovery podcast. This book is Grassroots, and then she already mentioned the other one she has coming out. So with that, I'm going to shut my cock holster up and any last... <laughs> Anything that you would like to say and just take it away, darling. Oh, my gratitude is to you for for having me, but also for bringing your message and your love and your light and your spirit to the people. I am grateful to you and for all the work you do. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Don't eat fentanyl candy. Thank you all so much for taking time to listen to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast. It really means everything to me. Look, if you love the show, you can find more information and resources at sexdrugsandjesus.com or wherever you listen to your podcast. Feel free to reach out to me directly at thebannon, sexdrugsandjesus.com, and on Twitter and Facebook as well. My name is Devannon. It's been wonderful being your host today. And just remember that everything is going to be all right.